Hi. Well, here we are with the Miller's Tale. Wow. In order to understand uh, the significance, if you will, of the Miller's Tale and all the kind of context of what's going on, we need to understand the Knight's Tale. Now, our book, voila, I don't know if you can see it in the background with the my you know my Hollywood high tech stuff here, but the uh, the Knight's Tale is not in our textbook. Okay, let's just say that the Knight's Tale is a truly long, long, long tale. I haven't had too many complaints that we don't read it. Let's just put it that way. Now, as you recall, in the uh, general prologue. Right, the knight was really, for all intents and purposes, the highest ranking uh, individual in the group in the, of the pilgrims in terms of social status. Right, uh, he has, of course, come from his uh, duties in war, where he's fighting for the uh, well for Christianity, essentially, and he is chivalrous beyond belief okay i mean one of the things about the uh, depiction of the knight in uh, the general prologue is he's too good you know i mean he's just absolutely like off the charts too good and, and in that respect you know chaucer was playing a little bit with the idea of chivalry which quite frankly was already kind of a, an old out of date idea right but the knight is, you know, he is one of the three most positive characters that are depicted, along with the parson and the plowman, who is, of course, the parson's brother, a, a lowly farmer. So each of the estates, right, the nobles, the church, and then the, the peasantry, if you will, uh, are represented. Now, the knight's tale, the tale that he tells in a mere 2,300 lines, is a classic love triangle story in which two young men, Palamon and Arcite, who are, if memory serves me correct, cousins. It kind of depends on the telling, right? Um, but they're cousins. And they both simultaneously fall in love with the same woman, Emily. Okay? And... Well, as I said, they're prisoners, you know, they're looking out through the, 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 the window of their cell. They see this beautiful woman. They both fall madly in love with her. And to make an incredibly long story short, um, they ultimately decide to have a battle at right, a tournament. And uh, whoever wins the tournament will win the hand of Emily. Who cares what she thinks, right? doesn't matter, right? Um, in the tale, Arcite prays to the god of war that he might win the battle and thus win Emily's hand. But he prays to the god of war. Palamon prays to the goddess of love that he wins the hand. So what happens is the um, Arcite wins the battle ultimately okay he won because he prayed to god of war but in his happy victory dance which is on top of a horse right uh well you know in football how when players score a touchdown often you see them spike the football well our site spiked himself he falls off the horse as he's prancing around the arena and incurs a fatal injury. Now, luckily, and it happens a lot in literature, uh, fatal injuries are not instantaneous. And so he has time to bless the marriage of Palamon and Emily, saying, you know, you should go on. Forget about me. It's okay. 
Shakespeare did this in a play called Two Noble Kinsmen. It's one of the works uh, that is believed to be co-authored uh, with another person, John Fletcher. It's not very good. In fact, I saw it on stage in the Old Globe one time years ago, and all I could think of is this is awful. Um, now, the Miller's Tale. We need to read the Miller's Tale and all the goings-ons within the tale as an answer to the Knight's Tale. Okay, so the Knight's Tale really stands before us, all joking aside, as high-class love affair, right? Two nobles who are in love with the same woman. They're both willing to die for her, but they both have, shall we say, a great deal of honor and integrity. They both really care about each other as well. And, you know, that's what makes it so difficult, right? And it's all very chaste, right? C-H-A-S-T-E, chaste, virtuous. It's all about love as a concept, right? Now, one of the things that you may have noticed as we kind of talk about the general prologue is this great variety of social class that we have in the pilgrims. As I said, the knight is at the highest end. But we have a lot of other people. All right. Now, the host, the host is excited and happy that this has all started off so well, right? And note that in the prologue, the host calls upon the monk to speak next. The monk basically representing the highest uh, member of the church who is uh, on the pilgrimage. The miller interrupts. Now, the miller is low class, right? He's a scoundrel, right? During the general prologue, you know, the narrator talks about how the miller cheats when he is doing his job. You know, he, he basically takes more than is allowed that he should take. You understand what a miller would do? Farmers would come in with their grain. He would mill their grain and he would keep some of it as his payment. But he has a way of being very sneaky and getting more than he's supposed to uh, for his payment, right? He's also a big drunk. we got a lot of drunks on this trip, by the way. Good thing nobody's driving. But he can barely stay on his horse, right? He can barely stay on his horse. Now, he wants to talk. He wants to give a uh, <clears throat> story that responds to the night. And everybody kind of knows right from the beginning that this guy is going to be crude. Right, it's going to be a little bit much. He even says, the Miller says, I know I'm drunk, I can tell by the sound of my voice. And he says, for I, and <clears throat> pardon my middle English, for I will tell a legend and a leaf, both of a carpenter and of his weaf, and how that a clerk hath set the right to scapa. So he's already announcing what he's going to do. He's going to tell a story about a carpenter and his wife does that sound familiar, by the way, to anybody? Carpenter, wife. And a clerk, meaning a student, a student who uh, kind of comes between them, if you will. Right? He makes a, as it says, makes a fool of a carpenter. Now, right away, one of the other guys on the pilgrimage, a guy who is called the Reeve, right? Uh, the Reeve, if you pay attention in the general product, had been a carpenter, okay? He had been a carpenter before, and he basically kind of starts taking this personally. And why do you got to tell such a bad story? Why do you got to talk about, you know, bad wives? And the miller was like, oh, no, no, there's like a hundred really good wives for every bad one. Sure. 100 really good wives. No, I'm sorry. He said a 1,000. A 1,000 good wives for every bad one. But come on. You know, this, uh, this is just a story, right? 
A husband shall not be inquisitive of God's privity nor of his wife. All right? You don't want to know the secrets of God or of your wife because you might not be too happy. Now, at this point, and I'm looking in the prologue, it's about line 59, where he says, What should I more say? But as his miller, he will know that his word is for no man forbearer, but told his churlish tale in his manner. All right? So he's going to go ahead, the narrator is going to go ahead and repeat the story. But remember, and this is important, uh, line 74, the miller is a churl, you know well this. So was the Rivik. Ik means also, by the way, that's a great Middle English word to know. And there, other there are more, and harlotry they told in both the two, a visit you and put to me out the blama, and ik men shall not make an earnest of gum. Don't be so serious. Do not make earnest of game. Do not take something so seriously, which is just meant in fun. Now, I say this to you. Here we are in, uh, you know, an online environment. Uh, I have taught this piece in class, in face-to-face -face classes, many, many times over the years, since shortly after it was first written, in fact. And... I cannot tell you how many times I've had students react like this. Oh, my, my God, I feel so sorry for John. This is horrible. It's like, let's remember. It's a story. It's a fiction. And it is basically like one long extended joke. Okay. So as we look at this, please do not try to take this too, too seriously. Okay. But this is, you know, this is the setup. Now, the tale is called a fableau, right? And you can see, I believe, in your textbook on page 282, it describes a fableau as a short story in verse, that means poetry, that deals satirically, often grossly and fantastically, as well as hilariously, with intrigues and deceptions about sex or money, and often both these elements in the same story. Okay, All right. So while the, the story is not necessarily, I wouldn't say it's too much about money. It's definitely about sex, though. So. Okay. The idea of the old husband and the young wife is an old story. All right. It's an old setup just rife for a third person, a young man, to come in because of the inappropriateness of the age difference. So you have a young woman who is married to an older guy. Now, why does this happen? Well, it happens for reasons that ought to be fairly obvious, but maybe we need to repeat. Women often died more than men. Well, not more. You can only die once. Died younger more frequently because of childbirth. Well, now, other things, you know, diseases obviously affected both genders. But young uh, women dying in childbirth was uh, a reality, okay? Uh, obviously, it's still a reality, but not nearly, nearly, nearly so much as it used to be, okay? So it's not all that unusual to see uh, the stories because you must have had a lot of situations where men would get older, right? They would continue to, shall we say, have money, right? Presumably. Uh, some sort of financial uh, status, and then get married again, right? Because they don't have, shall we say, the same kind of uh, uh, danger, right, that uh, a young woman faces, okay? So this is part of the setup, okay? Now, when we look at this, and we're, we're going to go into a second video in just a minute, but I want you to think about this. We have the setup for the triangle because, foolishly or not, John the Carpenter has uh, rented a room to a young college student, an Oxford student. There's not a lot of universities in those days. Mesa was not yet invented, right? Mesa College wasn't there. But in, in England, you did have Oxford, right? And so Nicholas... The young man is a college student. 
think of that.